right. Hello, everyone. Let's see. Can you guys hear me? Um, hopefully you can hear. Yeah, hopefully you can hear me. But let me know. Drop, maybe drop a drop a note if uh, I'm, I'm trying to. I'm trying a new mic today, so hopefully this uh, this is working out. Well, once again, welcome back to an episode, our fifth episode of Powered by ZRX. So this is a developer-focused live stream um, where we get to explore different features of the Xerox ecosystem um, and get to interview uh, builders who are building just really interesting projects um, on the Xerox tech stack. Um, so this live stream is for, for you, whether you're you know, building uh, novel financial tools or looking to integrate swapping into your application or just trying to understand the Xerox ecosystem, the protocol, the API, the governance, um, all that better. Well, this, uh, this show is for you. And I'm really excited to be your host for today. I am Jessica. I am the developer advocate at Xerox Labs. Um, and today we'll be uh, getting to interview um, two, two, two interesting guests, um, Josh and Joe from Minky, which is a non-custodial uh, DeFi wallet. So yeah, we'll definitely dive into you know, what that means, why is non-custodial important, um, you know, especially at this time um, when you know, we're, I'm sure, I'm sure uh, folks who have been been in the DeFi space um, past couple months kind of have have seen um, a lot of just craziness happen. So yeah, why is why is non custodial important? Um, and also, you know, what what is um, the founding mission of of Minky to to make saving, um, spending, and investing DeFi uh, just just easy for for the users? Um, so the format of the show today is that I'll be giving you a couple of announcements, um, and then during the presentation. So whether you're watching on Twitter or YouTube, um, please drop your questions in for the guests. So after, sorry, once they start, um, once I start interviewing them, uh, if you type your questions in, um, they'll be able to see them. And so this, this show is meant for, for you guys as the viewer to ask your questions um, to our guests today. And then, yeah, and after that, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up with, a, yeah, with the, any, any live Q and A's um, that, that come up. So yeah, to get started, then let me jump into the announcements for the day. So let me pull up that tab here. And uh, let me expand that out for for you all a little bit. So this um, for those who are who who are in New York uh, this week. So um, I was just talking with Josh backstage that we're actually both in New York City uh, this week for NFT NYC. So like one of the um, largest NFT conferences um, in the world. So yeah, it's just starting off this week. And Xerox Labs is super excited to have um, our co-founder Will be presenting on Thursday. So for those who are here Thursday, June 23rd at 2.10, 2, uh, he'll be presenting at Town Hall, um, talking about the future of NFTs and how that's powered uh, by how we see the Xerox pro protocol um, helping power that um, sort of exchange. So definitely check that out if you're in town. Um, if not, actually maybe check out his, uh, his episode one of uh, Power by Xerox. We definitely talk a little bit about that there. Um, let's see, so the next piece of news um, so kind of conferency related is, so our team is hosting a, um, our own conference. So in November, so November 2nd to 3rd, um, we're going to host Zero Expo. Um, and I think this is the second time we're hosting it. So this is a summit that's happening in San Francisco where um, we're bringing together various industry leaders um, and Web3 builders to get together and just talk about how we can uh, continue building out um, a decentralized exchange ecosystem. Um, and so if you're interested in attending or speaking, uh, definitely check out the link here. Um, yeah, if you're interested in attending, speaking, um, sponsoring as well. And also this is the as ETH SF. So if you're looking to, to San Francisco, this is you know, the perfect time to do it. Can combine two, um, two experiences with one. All right, so I'm gonna turn that screen sharing off. Okay, so with, with the news out of the way, um, I'm gonna you know, get to dive into the actual interview today. So, um, you know, as I was talking with them before, before this call, um, I think, so Joe had shared some articles with me that I was got, getting to read um, about, about their project. And I think I saw a couple of quotes that um, I guess I wanna read to kind of start off the, the presentation with. Um, I felt, I felt um, they kind of encapsulated um, this whole experience. Um, of why, why this app is important. Um, so kind of fun one here is, so the DeFi mullet is finally here with Minky. So we look like your favorite FinTech in the front, but we're powered by all the magic of DeFi in the back. And another quote is, so in my early days of crypto, 
one of the leading narratives was banking the unbanked. And yes, there were charlatans, but there was enough passion and real builders that it seemed like a reality. However, today as a space, we froth over Ponzi's and constantly push the crank, uh, push the latest crank onto those who've recently entered the space. And it's time that we get back to our roots, building a sustainable and groundbreaking protocol and start making a real impact. Um, and yeah, so hopefully, yeah, with that um, tone setting, um, we'll yeah, bring, bring the two guests on stage. So here's uh, Joe and Josh. Hey everyone, hey. good to be here. Hey, hey Jess. <laughs> hey, welcome. Um, yeah, once again, welcome um, to, to the show. Uh, how about we'll just do a round of introductions um, and then maybe a quick intro of you know, how, how you got into the Web3 space to begin with. Um, so. Cool. Um, yeah, so I'm Josh. I'm the CEO and co-founder at Minky. Uh, we're a gasless DeFi wallet that makes it really easy for anyone to save, spend, and invest on DeFi. And how I got into the space, so uh, before Minky in 2017, I built another product called Sendy. Um, if you were back then, you might remember Earn.com, where you could pay people to open your emails um, if it was kind of a one-to-one -one cold email. So it's very similar, um, except for uh, like a one-to-many. So if you were a marketer, you could reward people by a uh, if they open your emails uh, to get better engagement um, and grow your email list. Um, so even back then, uh, it, w it wasn't, re we weren't really building a product for crypto natives. We we're really building a product that helped people uh, who are either trying to like, grow their Substack list or just grow their general um, newsletter. And then on the other side, the people that were earning the points were usually people that, again, weren't crypto natives. They were looking at for a way to earn like microtransactions or just a little bit of money. And we had to build this um, experience, which was actually quite hard back then as like layer twos didn't exist um, a lot. Um, even what was available on layer ones in terms of uh, UI and infrastructure was really patchy. Um, so we had to learn a lot of things about building like a really user-friendly UX um, to kind of merge the crypto world with just the normal web two world, uh, which kind of leads us into Minky today, which is, yeah, trying to build the DeFi mullet. Um, it's a pretty popularized term, but uh, yeah, trying to do it, like try to uh, maintain, I guess, that like those non-custodial roots, um, yeah, completely. Yep, so I'm Joe. I'm head of marketing at Minky. I also deal with partnerships and all of that good stuff. My background, so I've been in crypto since 2017 as an investor, if you like, although I don't think what I was doing in 2017 could really be classed as investing. Um, but my background is actually in traditional finance, in regulatory risk. And I guess the more I think about it, it seems quite a strange career turn to go from regulatory risk to head of marketing for DeFi. But the more I think about it, the more it makes sense because in, in banking and in regulation, there's, there's different types of specializations in reg risk. And mine was very much consumer focused and kind of interpreting the rules and regulations to make sure that banks are interpreting them correctly and doing things that let the customers understand, you know, what they needed to know about finance as a whole. And I think that translates really nicely into explaining why I'm, I'm in DeFi and in particular Minky. So I, yes, as I said, I got into crypto in 2017. I very much fell in love with the industry in terms of the philosophy of decentralization, transparency, integrity, all of those good things. And very much like the quote that you just mentioned, Jess, that was one of Josh's quotes, um, that was kind of one of the fundamental reasons I came to Minky. The, I think a lot of us got into the space for those values. And Minky very much kind of sums up those values for me. I think in a bull market, it's very easy to kind of run with the new narrative and the new Ponzi. And I am not, I'm not a snobby investor. I can see the benefits in all different types of, um, you know, narratives. However, it's nice to now be in a, be a, be a bit of a bear market and, I would never say it's nice what's happened recently and obviously there's plenty we can discuss about that but it's it's nice to see that I think sustainable DeFi had lost a bit of the the coolness 
um, since 2020. And I think now we're really we're really seeing why it's so important, and and that narrative will will kind of hopefully come back a little bit. Yeah, I think kind of definitely the narr the running theme um, that between the both of y'all is you're really focusing on just the 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 people's experience through it. So whether that's um, in the in the application, um, the UI, or from like the the regulatory stances, or you know just understanding why this space is important, um, depending on where you live in the world. Um, and it comes in so many different flavors. Um, yeah, so maybe just to get off, get the conversation um, going about, um, get the conversation going on, on Ninky itself. Um, I think the the name, it, when I first asked you guys about the name, I feel like that um, that kind of encapsulated the, the, uh, the, the narrative. So I'd love to have you explain where the name is coming from and um, probably correct the pronunciation because um, I, I always forget if I'm pronouncing. <laughs> Minky's correct. So uh, yeah, the the name came. So I guess from the common, I guess like crypto slang or crypto term, like a whale is usually like someone that's moving like very large amounts of money. So before layer twos came about, or even I guess like lower cost chains like Polygon, um, DeFi and Ethereum was very much like for very big whales. Um, I had used it sparringly myself, like when, and you tried to like find times when gas fees were really low and like tried to like make sure like you're using um, as much, like moving as much money as possible, I guess, to make the fees actually make sense. Um, so Minky um, is, is a whale, but it's the most common whale um, in the sea. So in a way it's DeFi for commoners. Um, we tried to make DeFi that's very accessible. And I guess with the advent of layer twos, you could finally build an actual consumer app. Um, and I guess with Polygon, which we're built on top of, um, you could actually build, use build something that was usable by anyone anywhere. I, um, I, and I guess Minky is gasless too. So um, in terms of usability, but in, even in terms of like gas restrictions, um, we wanted to build a tool that no one even had to think about that. Um, and so that's where the name Minky came from. Um, so yeah, DeFi, DeFi that's finally accessible for the masses. Yeah. I feel like when, when, projects, name, when projects name their projects, um, yeah, I just like the thought behind it. I think, yeah, there's, there's often a really interesting story. Um, well, how about to help users visualize what is it that we're talking about? Um, I'll have you share the application um, and talk through the different portions. Um, yeah, so this is Minky now. This is just a little test wallet I have. Okay. But it, it's meant to be as intuitive as your bank. So I guess the term is like the mom test. Um, can, can your mom understand this? Um, and it's actually something both me and my co-founder Marcus tested on our moms too. Um, so um, we tried, um, when we actually created Minky, we looked um, at a lot of like existing banking apps and fintech apps like Revolut. Um, um, and also like comparing that to, uh, I guess, the common DeFi wallets at the time. Um, I guess like Dharma was one of the leading ones that we really kind of tested and tried to improve upon. Um, I think they've acquired by OpenSea now. Um, but yeah, with Minky, um, it's a really easy way to onboard into crypto is the first bit. So everything's um, on Polygon. So um, we use Wire for this with Apple Pay, but in three clicks, you can top up with Apple Pay. I don't think that's going to work on my laptop here. Um, but we also uh, add um, local bank uh, networks as well. So uh, Minky is really for people everywhere. We're not focused on just the U.S. or or just Western countries. I think a lot of where the value is in DeFi is in uh, emerging markets where you have high inflation, and DeFi is actually the best way for them to save in U.S. dollars. So um, my account set up for Australia because I'm usually in Australia. Um, but yeah, we have Pay ID there, which is um, we, uh, actually we charge zero fees other than our like small commission. Um, to top up via the local bank network. And you can top up, I think, as little as 50 USDC. Um, and and we have over, uh, we're adding over 42 local bank networks already. So um, we're starting to add emerging markets like um, Brazil as well. So I think even then it's like $10 USDC minimum. Um, and you can go from Brazilian Real on your bank account straight to USDC, which is pretty powerful. And we're actually localized too in these uh, regions. So um, if you set your uh, language 
um, were available in Portuguese too, and um, we're really looking to expand in that market. Um, but once you get USDC, the wallet is entirely gasless. So sending, swapping, and um, saving, it, you don't need Matic, um, which is one of the biggest things um, trying to get new users on board. Like, yes, they could get USDC, but then can, like, trying to explain that you needed another token, whether that be ETH or Matic to someone um, to do anything in the app was really confronting like no you had it took almost minutes sometimes an hour to explain to people and I still don't think they get it uh, so we really thought like okay how do we get rid of um yeah people needing gas while, while still maintaining a non-custodial infrastructure uh, so um, we use a tool called Biconomy that powers that um, on top of Polygon, and we write our own contracts around things like mStable and Aave. Um, but yeah, when you go to deposits, you don't need Matic. Um, you can see there's no gas fees here. We actually cover that. Um, you just need to, once you get used to DC, it's essentially three clicks. And then, um, yeah, you, you are depositing into... Um, these protocols and earning interest, which is actually not only quicker than any other wallet, but it's actually quicker than a lot of centralized apps too. Um, because we know that we're going after smaller deposits, um, we have a weekly limit of $500 US. Um, we can just do level one KYC, which is just your name and physical address, I think your email. Um, so um, there's no weird ID check um, that, that really, I guess, like confronts a lot of people when we operate in this low trust environment. Um, and I guess how we use 0x, um, there's also um, gas-free swapping. So if I wanted to swap from USDC or maybe I'll, uh, with Matic, it'll charge me. But maybe if I just want to swap from Aave um, back to USDC and then I do the max, uh, then I just have to do this. Again, it's not going to charge me anything. And I'm, yeah, 0x is aggregating, finding the best route via quick swap. And very, very simple um, infrastructure. I, I think when you swap Matic, um, then you, you are required to pay a Matic because yeah, if you have Matic, <laughs> you, <laughs> there are gas fees, but um, yeah, from this makes it really easy too for people to buy different tokens. Um, and, and even if they get tokens from elsewhere, whether that might be, oh, I think that one failed for some reason, but um, maybe I'll swap USDC. Um, yeah, I'll swap to Matic. Uh, do. Yeah. Um, it's okay. It's always term. That happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It always happens on a demo. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> sure why. <laughs> but yeah, that one worked. <laughs> yeah. That one, we don't even have the error message showing. So it's a new error. Um, but yeah, that, that one worked in Tomatic. Um, and then, yeah, as, as well as all the token sending is gasless as well. So you can add contacts um, if I wanted to send to myself. We're, we're fully integrated with ENS, um, even though it's on Polygon. So we check uh, mainnet to find your ENS. And um, you can send Matic or Aave back to people. So if I can send myself um, like a bit of Aave. And again, um, don't need any Matic. Um, it's just all guessless and really easy um, for anyone to use. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the main iteration of Minky now, uh, saving, uh, sending, and swapping. But um, yeah, pr pretty keen to like add more features that I guess we can talk about um, for the rest yeah. of the stream. Well, yeah, that was definitely like so many, so many, uh, so many goodies like packed into one. So I will, I take take um, kind of un, what's it called, unravel. I <laughs> The pieces that um, you you just demoed to us because um, yeah that was that was great so maybe starting off with the localization part so um, you know you were talking about you were showing the screen with all the the different local markets that you're you're working in right now um, so you know I don't see that often yeah. um, in a lot of different projects so maybe you can talk me through um, you know what does it take to to localize a DeFi application um, you know what does marketing look like um, you know, what what are the efforts that are happening behind the scenes um, for for this kind of work. Yeah. Um, so it, I, I guess the hardest thing is, is scaling up the team in these regions, like essentially starting from zero. So um, we hired a head of growth actually last week. Um, we already had a, an existing team in Brazil, but mainly um, on the dev side, but hired a head of growth um, that came over from Nexo last week. So um, always good to uh, pull someone from CFI and <laughs> uh, convince them on our DeFi ways. Um, 
but the first, yeah, the first part, I guess, is like establishing presence there. So um, my co-founder, Marcos, he lives in Portugal, but he's Brazilian. So that, that helps a little bit in those markets. But um, I think that will be probably the biggest challenge as we try to go to other markets. Um, and then uh, it's adding the different payment methods. So um, we have uh, Brazilia, Brazil Live Now. Um, where if you top up, uh, you have PIX, which is their local bank transfer. Um, and uh, next week uh, we'll have um, Turkey. They actually don't have a name for it, but it's called bank transfers in Turkey, which is another market um, that is see seeing like hyperinflation now. Um, and again, it's impossible for them to save in USD in any other way um, other than stable coins. So um, going there um, and then um, localizing like language in my view is pretty easy these days. Um, you have IITN, um, and there's a lot of great services that um, you can use to do it pretty quickly. Um, but I guess the biggest thing is like establishing the market and finding the infrastructure because yeah, Apple Pay is cool to top up via Apple Pay, but it's generally pretty expensive to move money via uh, Visa and Mastercard. So yeah, you, you're seeing pretty high fees, and you have to move like uh, it's a hundred dollars minimum. So again, like pretty large amounts. Um, which in these markets is, is a lot of money. So being able to offer a very cheap, low fee, local bank transfer method um, is very important. So um, yeah, thankful like we have awesome, really awesome partners. Um, we use banks uh, for picks, um, but um, looking to integrate other ones like Exxon Pool um, for Southeast Asia as well. Nice. So are, is our Joe? Joe, sorry, is Joe? Are you the one that's working on finding the partnerships? Um, in, in these different markets? No, so in different markets, as, mm. as Josh said, we kind of, we want to get boots on the ground. So the different markets work really differently. So although we will work closely as a team, I think it's really important to have people who know. So for example, in the US, in the UK, and I, th I would say Australia as well, sh social media is used quite prominently, but, in other markets, you'll find kind of different niches and different ways of interacting. So what works for the US definitely won't work in Brazil in terms of they are looking for different answers to similar questions. So having that firsthand experience of, you know, what we need to talk about, what people care about, it'll come through having people who understand the localities and having conversations in those countries as well to make sure that we can, you know, build the app whilst we're localizing it and having the the app in different languages is really important and a great step i think from a from a marketing perspective we want to be able to provide educational content as well because this is a huge part of it so as as we've spoken about we are i think we are building a really nice user interface for defi and what we want to do is build something that complements traditional finance. So naturally, we're going to have users that might not know quite as much about crypto or DeFi. So it's really important that we can educate them. And, you know, we can't do that without understanding what the people, the what our users know, don't know, and yeah, tailoring it for them, for them the best we can. Yeah, I think that, like you mentioned, the education piece is super vital. Depending on, yeah, depending on, um, there's so many different layers to it, like how their interaction with technology to begin with, also interaction with um, finance. Um, there's so many layers um, that and how, make it very yeah. mm -hmm. So from a consumer perspective and thinking back to traditional finance, there's also a line of, and this is something we've really thought about when building Minky. We want to simplify things, but what we can't do is simplify them so much that it's not transparent and it's not clear. So there's improvements that we can make. So we all know, um, I, I suspect a lot of the people watching are developers and more tech focused. We can talk <laughs> and we can explain what a blockchain is and we can have these conversations, but I think what there's lacking in the industry is education that removes the kind of, you know, complex terms and jargon. And there's, there's a lot of people trying to do it, but it's just really not easy. So yeah, that, that's one of my key focuses, how to provide education that informs, but doesn't confuse, but is transparent and lets people understand the risks of everything that they're doing, as well as the benefits in a really clear and not, you know, not scary way.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say it's like something that we try to like constantly improve on. I think we do a decent job, but it's actually quite hard. Um, I, I studied finance back in university. Um, and when I first started Minky, I tried to explain kind of these DeFi concepts based on an existing traditional finance concept. But then you quickly realize that most people actually don't understand the traditional finance concept. So you have to almost explain both at the same time um, and still like, create this uh like very intuitive i guess um app that it's it's transparent but um yeah still uh, you don't really need to fully understand it i guess um but yeah it's something that we're constantly improving on testing things um yeah talking to a lot of people um and i guess seeing what sticks yeah i think to your i think you had a, a mention in, in the teaser about essentially building web3 apps for for web2 users and then it got me thinking, like, is it that we want Web2 users to evolve to be Web3 users? Like, do we keep them? Is it more comfortable in a Web2 world? Um, are there things that, I don't know, like little, even little interactions, like a token allowance, um, like allowing, allowing, um, allowing exchange to move your funds? Like, how much of that, like, is, should be surfaced in an application? Um, in a wallet when a transaction is happening versus um, kind of hiding hiding that and or not hiding it but like how how much information should be presented so that someone's mm. not overwhelmed but also informed um, you know just these little things that I, I think the the experience is the experience of using um, web three apps is slowly evolving um, so I'm I'm curious with essentially this next cycle of uh, of DeFi kind of where where things will will uh, evolve to next. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, hey, that, even that that token allowance is a fun one. It probably doesn't show in this wallet because I've already done um, the initial allowance. Um, but trying to obscure that away. So when you actually um, create the account, um, we call it like opening an account. So you open an Aave savings account or you open a M-stable savings account. Um, and that actually does the token allowance transaction um, and then gives some risk. So. Yeah, I think it's important to do those, like, and have people accept them. But I'm um, trying to, but just uh, I guess adapt them a little bit. Yeah, it, it's a it's a meeting people halfway, I think, between Web two and Web three, and just trying to like simplify. I wouldn't say dumb down the concepts, but maybe like undev them a little bit. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that was what I was gonna say. So my. I am probably biased on this front, but I would say the important thing is, and this is why I'm so bullish on having DeFi companies that are built by people with kinds of DeFi values rather than the centralized kinds of um, alternatives. The most important thing for me to help people understand who are new to crypto and DeFi is the values and why we, why we think you know, having a portion of your assets held in a non-custodial wallet is important. And talking back, back to the token approvals, I think one of the conversations I've heard recently about, you know, the Web 2, Web 3 languages, should a wallet even be called a wallet? Does that make sense? So there's so many different rabbit holes that you can go down. But I think I think front and center for me is communicating why we have these values, what the, the fundamental kinds of reasoning for this and then yeah we don't necessarily know how the technical aspects of our regular banks work rightly or wrongly but i think we've managed for how many years without understanding the complex the complexities of databases so yeah i think personally values but i might you know be biased no i think you're well maybe you're preaching to the choir here but um I, yeah the values is Yes, it's super important. Also, especially I think in this kind of calmer time um, uh, of the of the Web three space, I feel like this is a really good time to just you know for those who are building, be reflective of how how and what we're building. Um, and so I think this is a great conversation to have um, at this time. Um, so I'll, let's kind of dive back into more of uh, the the working bits of the application. Um, so let's see. So I think you'd mentioned. In terms of the the savings um, that can come around, um, so you, the when the, oh, sorry when a user invests um, in in Minky, um, what where where is that money going? How how are they getting savings? Um, 
you know, what's, hap- what's happening to their funds than back. Yes. Yeah, so uh, we, we offer two protocols um, and, and we will offer more in the future as well. So um, default on Polygon is mstable um, on um, Ethereum mainnet, it's Aave. Um, how mstable works, um, it's actually very simple. Um, sometimes it gets confusing, but it, it, the funds go, um, again, actually through mstable into Aave um, or um, on mainnet, I think it's in, into compound as well. Um, and then um, all the yield from every stable coin kind of gets merged into one. So um, say Tether, DAI, USDC, um, uh, I think um, on mainnet it's Frax as well. Um, so you can earn um, not just the yield on USDC. So if you're seeing a higher yield, let's say on SUSDC, like last week, um, I think it was like 25% or something like that. Um, you earn that higher yield, even if you're saving and die. Um, but yeah, I guess very safe is it's going into, um, you, it's still going into like Aave, which is the leading um, AMM or um, I guess lending and borrowing protocol. Um, and then there's added yield from swaps as well. So um, mStable um, also has a swap feature where if you have um, USDC, you can do a low swippage swap to Tether or DAI, very similar to Curve, um, but I, I guess uh, Curve isn't available on Polygon, so mStable is generally one of the defaults there. So um, you not only earn yield from um, lending out your money, you also earn yield by from providing liquidity, um, which gives an added boost. So I think it's a bit lower today at 2%, but you're usually about a percentage more than Aave, um, which is pretty good, um, makes it pretty competitive. Um, and when you kind of have these um, crazy market conditions and a lot of swaps are happening, um, when people have to even like repay their loans, um, you see rates that are really high. Um, and we always just pass on the full variable rate. Um, so I think last week on Thursday, it was about 12%. Um, and I think over the last year on mStable, it was, I think like 9.44, I don't have the exact number, um, but um, yeah, like, like a very, very competitive rate. Um, and um, we don't earn anything on that, whatever the rate is um, on the protocol, um, we're just your interface to access that. So um, we're not taking any margin or, or fee like a lot of the centralized providers are um, and everything's transparent and on chain. Um, well, do you want to also you say you're so you're not taking fees, and then um, it's also gasless. So can you talk a bit about how how the, how you, how the team handles that? Yeah, so um, we do earn fees on the fiat on ramps. So um, when you go from fiat to crypto, we take um, fifty basis points or 05 percent there, um, and also on the exchange, um, which is a cool thing about zero x. Um, it, it allows us to monetize Minky in. I guess other ways. Um, so um, if you're not maybe topping up from Minky, but you're transferring in, let's say, Matic or ETH um, from another wallet um, and you want to exchange to USDC, um, we can monetize a little bit there. So we take 50 basis points and we do cover your gas fees. Um, but yeah, that, that kind of um, is the only way we monetize right now. Um, and we, we generally want to keep the saving um, fee free. Um, it's kind of like when Robin Hood were the good guys. Um, it's like uh, commission free trading. Um, we see ourselves as commission free savings. Um, so kind of, so still a little bit related to uh, the, the earnings part of it. So since Slominki so is putting uh, funds into projects like Mstable, um, which if I understand like Staking anyone who stakes there gets certain token rewards back. Um, so, mm. so Mickey receives it, and is that, is that correct? And then yeah, you know, uh, I guess the the yields you get back, you just oh. that just go yeah, um, just gets fun to you. Um, there are um, token rewards as well, like uh, I guess the APR um, that's paid in the MTA token. Um, that currently um, we yeah we. Based on how the contract works, um, they have like a V, not a VE token model. I can't remember exactly what it's called, but they have an interest bearing token. So in our contract, we um, essentially uh, mint and burn a token that represents a one to one representation of their interest bearing token. So we can have that relayer. And, uh, but the problem is, um, with these relayer contracts, you can't really assign the rewards. So the rewards kind of just go into the contract and we can claim it. Um, so um, over time, we're looking at ways that we can kind of abstract that away into our rewards. So maybe the protocol, um, like our, we'll call it our protocol, let's say protocol will take any of the APR rewards, um, but then uh, maybe we issue 
our own token, um, which might, might be a thing. So like a Minky token. Um, and then that Minky token um, has governance rights over the treasury um, that is earning any APRs from or APR rewards from um, any protocol that we use. Cool. So yeah, maybe a DAO down the line. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe a DAO down the line. Yeah. How oh, interesting. And the whole project itself is open source. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, so we're open source. Um, everything's on GitHub. Um, yeah, I, I think that's very important. I, like our, yeah. our main value is transparency. Um, and I, I think the, if you're using a wallet, you should demand open source infrastructure so um, the community can have a look at it, um, can, can be audited. Um, so um, yeah, we're, we're built to open source. And, and I think some people don't like open source. They say, oh, you don't have any IP on that. Um, and you just, but I, I think that that's crypto ideals. Um, and we actually rely on a lot of other people that are open source to get started. Um, we started, me and Marco started hacking on Minky uh, kind of late last year in September, October, um, quit our jobs uh, at the start of this year. So uh, we've gotten to, off to like a pretty quick start, but the only way we are able to do that is, um, yeah, relying on a help from a lot of the community. So um, people in the zero X community, um, Rainbow, I think, is one of like the leading open source wallets. Um, being able to look at what they've built and comparing what other people have built is what what um, has helped us get started. Um, and we actually had people reach out to us, like saying, "Oh, um, they're kind of like beating around the bush." And we say, "Like, hey, like you can fork our code, go for it." <laughs> like, we've essentially forked other people's code at points too. Like, um, I think. Um, the more we can learn from each other, the better. And um, we're all trying to like, most most of us are like trying to like push forward like the same ideals and like get more people into the space. So um, the faster we can all move, the better. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Let's see. Well, I wanted to take a pause and for those who are who are watching in the audience, um, yeah, please feel free to drop your questions in, um, in in the chat. I'd be curious to hear, you know, has it went out there used Minky? Is, your, is this your first time? hearing about it and that's what intrigues you um, to jump into to, into this call um, or are you are you building your own um, you know, DeFi wallet and you know just interested about about that space in general so yeah please please drop your uh, comments and questions uh, into into the chat um, let's see so how about we'll take a little pivot over to kind of what what's next um, what's what's on the roadmap for for Mickey? Yes. Yeah, so next is spend. So there was always going to be three pillars uh, to Binky, I guess, like in the title, like saving, uh, borrowing, and investing. I, I guess spending and borrowing um, is a little bit of the same. Um, what one of my motivations for starting Minky is um, actually like just getting liquidity myself and being able to spend crypto. Um, I remember explaining it to one friend saying, uh, if you want to, so I was like, oh, you don't want to sell it. You can just get borrow on Aave, um, get some USDC or die, then put it on this spend card and go spend on a spend card. It's like really broken setup with like five different um, things. So we want to try to bring, um, like make a really easy spend experience in Minky. So um, yeah, being able to borrow against your crypto using something like Aave. Um, so if you have something like ETH or what, whatever collateral, um, creating a really nice experience where you can get some liquidity and put that onto a spend card. Um, and we're, we're actually um, looking to brand uh, that spend card with uh, different NFT projects. Um, can't announce like the ones that we're, um, we've already signed up to work with, but I guess that's a little bit of why I'm here at NFT NYC as well, um, to hopefully find a few more partners. Um, but we, we really see like NFTs and, and finance um, really like merging as one. Like, I think NFTs are kind of this like cultural, almost like country club. And while here there's like pretty cool tools like Chain Pass and a few other things um, to kind of like show token ownership um, at like Web3 native events where you can scan a QR code, um, I, I don't think, again, that merges very well with the real world. Um, uh, back in uni, uh, we used to have like, the, I can't remember what it was called, like a student pass or a uni days. I think in Australia, it's called uni days, like a gift card, like, like a membership card. And you would get 10% off at different stores, at bars. And um, I kind of see NFTs in a, in a similar to that, like you, be, you have similar communities 
Um, but people aren't going to scan a wallet or scan a pass. They just want to see a card. Um, so we want to um, co-brand, or I guess not what we want to, we are, we're co-branding an NFT spend card um, with these different communities um, and, and building, I guess, out all the financial infrastructure for them um, to give their community a way to spend crypto. Um, but we're also building out the rewards infrastructure as well. So um, if their community really values, let's say gaming, um, and they want, they want like a PS Plus membership or an Xbox membership, they can can, um, I, I guess, subsidize that for their community through the card. Um, and then uh, we'll work with them to also get like IRL benefits too. So um, maybe if their community is um, in like someplace like New York, um, we can um, have boots on the ground and trying to get benefits um, kind of in a global, like a like a global hub for every project, but then they can kind of tailor which ones um, show for their community, but kind of just showing your, maybe your uh, Pudgy Penguins card or your Board Ape Club, uh, Club and you'll have like a little minky logo on the back um, and that'll get you discounts um, in the real world too, um, which I think is really important and kind of merges um, you know, the Web3 and Web2 worlds in a play. So um, yeah, NFT holders can get utility um, as well. Um, yeah. yeah, I think you're talking about the, the point of essentially the physical component is still super important to people, um, you know, even though all this a lot of what we talk about right now is um, very digital, but um, having having that physical component still, there's some like emotional attachment to it um, that you know, I don't think it's going to go away. Um, you know, no matter what we say, it's like when people when uh, digital books came online, and then people were afraid that hard 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 cover or hard paperbacks were just going to uh, mm -hmm. disappear. I think there's still something about the um, I don't know, whether it's nostalgia or whatnot, but it kind of reminds me. There's this uh, project called. Um, Meta Factory, so they're really focused on bridging that physical to digital world. So mm -hmm. um, I'm just thinking of my my at the at East Denver. Um, my my sister was um, they were doing a LARPing event. So LARPing is live action role playing. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the, the, a gaming sword, and you know when you win, it's like there's a chip in there that's attached to um, some like NFT sword online. So there's like that, that connection there. So, you know, that's a very game gaming centric um, example, but there's a lot of these other um, physical to digital ties that I'm sure we'll, mm -hmm. we'll see more of more and more of um, as you're alluding to. Yeah. And I think it's also just nice. I think of my NFTs aren't worth that much um, <laughs> in this market, but I think there are some people like a bit worried walking around at, um, New York this week with their like uh, 10 ETH floor NFTs and their hot wallet. So um, yeah, like, like having a physical representation of that, I think is important as well. <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> like it's here. Um, let's see. Uh, I think, did we, let's see, did we mention any points that uh, you guys wanted to talk about that we haven't yet? Um, yeah, I guess we can just talk about maybe like like general like DeFi and like how, how what's yeah. what is the short term future of DeFi. I, I think um, to be honest, it has been a little bit challenging. Like the last few weeks have been crazy, right? Um, since um, all the Celsius drama um, and, and really still like the lack of transparency there, um, it, it's been hard to operate. A DeFi protocol, or not a D, like I guess a DeFi savings app, which is what we primarily are now, right? Um, we, we are non-custodial, very, very different project, very I think very different values as well. But to the normal person, um, it's very hard for them to distinguish, especially because Celsius used this very like DeFi meme. Um, tone of voice and branding, right? Even though they weren't like saying unbank yourself. Um, so a normal person doesn't understand that. So um, I think as a community, it's not just us, but I think as a community, we, we really need to like stand up for DeFi, I think, and what it means. Because yeah, if you look at a lot of the threads, um, talking about Celsius, you just see the Bitcoiners and they're really saying, oh, I knew DeFi was all a scam. <laughs> so I, 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 really, I really like Bitcoin as well, but it's like, the, see, Celsius is not DeFi. Um, like, BlockFi is a bit different, but um, a lot of these tools that um, have run into trouble are really CeFi um, collapsing. And that is really actually what 
I think were the main ideals of crypto that we try to get away from, right? Like Bitcoin was created after the financial crisis when you had um, Lehman Brothers and uh, like, I think like Bear Stearns, like taking extreme risk um, and the average person didn't have any transparency. And that's actually like exactly what these CFI protocols like Celsius were doing, right? Um, they're almost operating like, operating like a quasi hedge fund um, with zero consumer disclosure um, and taking really obscene risks um, with normal people's money. And it isn't like the money that they're investing with and expecting maybe like a three X return, which in, in that case, maybe it's okay. But um, people see, saw this as a no risk savings um, which is kind of like what Luna and Anchor and, and all these things were branded as. And I, I think it, it's going to be hard for us as an industry to recover from that. But I think um, we all just need to be like really loud about this is why we're different. Um, and I guess, yeah, try, still like keep, keep fighting the good fight, like build, but also grow, like not just build, but I think like, talk about I guess like what, what we're doing now like it's not just building it, it's also like preaching a lot um mm -hmm. and, and trying to grow what we do because I think the only thing that really makes a difference at the end of the day like yeah you can have the most amazing product in the world um you can have all these great ideals but the only thing that's going to get you through is like actually creating better consumer outcomes um and that's a mix of building and grow and like growth and marketing. So I think that's what we all have to do in the space and DeFi, NFTs and everything. Um, it'll be really important. So yeah, that's kind of why we're trying to like focus too on these like emerging markets because um, kind of like Bitcoin, right? But when I got into Bitcoin or I guess first heard about Bitcoin, I was like, the, I like to say like I was a very informed bear, but I would just tell people like, there's no way that this thing is ever going to, to survive right like governments are just going to completely shut it down uh, and actually to just say i'm still surprised that it's alive like when i see like Cong like congress people um going on about like on bitcoin and supporting bitcoin it, it still surprises me to this day i never thought we'd get this far back in 2014 but I, i'm still amazed by the people that in 2013 2014 said that when i saw bitcoin for the first time i knew it was the future it's like what were you seeing that i wasn't seeing man like i saw that as always well. a healthy, like, being a healthy skeptic. yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's like, like the, so, yeah but, but i think that like cz stories like i but the same day i saw it, I spent all night and it's like the day the time I saw it I thought it was cool like I, yeah I spent like all day on it like look going into like the history of e-gold and everything and my thought was like yeah they're gonna shut this down like there's no way we survive like, and even like and it wasn't like shutting down the chain I so I thought like okay um they're gonna shut off like all the fiat on ramps um so it's gonna kind of kill the industry that way um but yeah so like uh, I think we have a lot of work to do like there's going to be a lot of regulatory um i think oversight coming from this um but if we can create better outcomes especially in like developing markets like brazil or turkey or lebanon where people are experiencing hyperinflation um and creating a great solution for them with DeFi, um we, we actually see a lot of organic growth in these markets and we're trying to understand more like where are people actually getting crypto from I, we have mm -hmm. some users in lebanon and we've actually looked at it like how do we support them like there's actually zero way for us to provide like a fiat on ramp um but they're somehow using the app um so uh, and, and we are creating like a better consumer outcome for them i think they've seen like 90 percent inflation over the last year or even more than that um and they're completely shut off from um like international financial infrastructure um so there is a lot of i think great outcomes that we are do uh creating but yeah it's about continuing to build those out to get them at scale and then sharing that um, because yeah this can it's probably going to be pretty challenging going forward one thing that i'd add to that from a marketing perspective is although yes we have seen chaos and it has been difficult to operate a, a, you know, a, a kind of DeFi saving product given everything that's happened. I've seen some really interesting conversations happening both from a Minky perspective. So we've had responses to some of our ads and a real 
plus I'm taking from this is people are starting to ask us really difficult questions. Not difficult for us because we can give the right answers. So yes, we're non-custodial. No, we didn't put your money in, you know, super high yield protocols. The answers that I can give, and I'm really happy to say this, are you know the answers that I'd want to give but the fact that these people are now asking these questions although we don't want to see the industry chaos and we didn't want you know so many people to lose so much money it's educating people like never before and yes it's a shame but as Josh said I think we can we can use this opportunity to really have these conversations and be loud about this is why we made those decisions um, I think a lot of people capitalized from what I've been referring to as the decentralization bias. I think for more mainstream users who don't necessarily use DeFi, but have potentially bought some crypto on an exchange, they might be users who would use these more centralized savings providers. And there's a real bias to think that any company operating crypto services is decentralized. And of course, we know that isn't the case, but because decentralization is such a buzzword in crypto, it's led to this situation where people aren't educated around non-custodial solutions and why why they need to, you know, pay attention to small print and really learn about the services that they're using. So I think, although it's difficult, there's real positives to take from it as well mm. in the long run. Yeah, um, yeah, it's really, it's <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that was well said. Yeah, I, but, yeah, I, I made it out a bit, to be it hard, but yeah, there are very good benefits as well. I would mm -hmm. also say our, our biggest competitor in Celsius is gone, which is always a nice thing. <laughs> Not nice that people lost money, but yeah, mm -hmm. it's always nice, I guess, from the, we're all running a business at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. Well, I guess keeps coming circling back to the, the educational piece of it. And I guess I'm ha happy to hear that people, you're having users ask the harder questions and, you know, they've seen what's happening or they've maybe experienced um, some of some of the chaos of um, you know, investing with custodial, custodial wallets and just wanting to, you know, understand, um, yeah, you know, they, they, they're, it's coming more, more to light. Um, so feels like everything old is new again um, back back around like 2017 you know early on when uh, like DeFi was coming coming becoming a thing and um, you know the, the first quote from the beginning of this uh, conversation um, that I read from you guys yeah it just feels feels like hopefully um, you know we're getting back to getting back to kind of where we started from um, yeah and so I think it's super important that you guys are, are building open source with that transparency um, I know you mentioned a bit about you know questioning the IP that comes with being open source, but I feel like you can't really open source your community. Um, even even if projects fork um, fork an open source project, there's something about you know one project that one, the original project that keeps keeps a company keeps the community tied um, tied to that project. You know if it's good, if it's um, there's something about it that really really draws them to it. So. Um, yeah, I guess I'm excited to see see where you guys go. Yes. We're wrapping that one up with. Um, yeah. So maybe just to, to wrap it up then, um, are there some resources you'd like to share with uh, with with the audience um, in any career openings? Um, any, any plugs that you'd like to um, shout out before we wrap it up for today? Yeah, so um, yeah, definitely follow us on Twitter. So I think mine and Joe's uh, personal Twitters are there, but um, at minky.app. Um, and then if you're um, Brazilian or Portuguese speaking um, at minky.app underscore BR. Um, yeah, and I guess download the app. Um, we, we always love feedback from the community. So um, you can search us on the iOS app store or just go to minky.app as well and download the app. Um, we'll have Android coming live um, probably later next month, which is pretty exciting too. And yeah, in, in terms of career openings, we just hired our head of growth in Brazil, but we're looking to um, uh expand out that team. So there's no open roles yet. But um, if you are in Brazil, um, definitely um, reach out to us. Um, and yeah, we can keep you in the loop as we start to grow that team out. Um, and also in any of these other like emerging markets too. So um, uh, markets we're looking at now are Argentina, Turkey, um, Indonesia, and Malaysia. So um, if you're there, um, you're building in the space, either as a developer, marketer, community person, um, reach out to us and uh, we'd love to have you involved at some stage. 
I'd also add that anybody, so from a partnerships perspective, any other projects that are listening, if you kind of vibe with what we're saying, um, please feel free to get in touch. We really, at this time, want to collaborate as much as we can and amplify the importance of sustainable DeFi, transparent finance, and all of those good things. So even if you don't think that are products necessarily work together we can always have a conversation and see where it goes yeah some great shout outs and for who, those who are watching definitely check out the links um linked in youtube uh, there's some good write-ups there um in the, the app um to to yeah check it out and then offer feedback um to the team um, yes so come to our discord and give us feedback we love feedback nice um i guess with that uh we will Let's see if there's any last minute things. I think so. All right. So yeah, happy. Yeah, this was a really awesome conversation. I think um, super timely as well. I think even you know with yeah. with all the yeah, um, just kind of where we are yeah. in terms of like the like getting to be an acquirer building mentality and just really being thoughtful about um, how we build moving forward. So thank you again for for coming on. Um, it was a pleasure getting to to chat with you, Joe and uh, Josh. So hopefully we'll get to. Uh, have you on in future episodes um if anything yeah as, as things continue to build up with with uh minky so with that we'll call it a day yeah thanks everyone thanks jess thank you yeah. Sorry, bye. Bye.